Welcome to the Saving Lives Podcast. I'm Eddie Joe. Today is the 11th of September of 2020, and I'm giving part two of my career advice as to why you should not pursue critical care medicine if you're a physician or NP, PA, or even a nurse for that matter. In part one, I discussed some of the nuances of critical care, but I also did say that I love my job and I'm, I'm doing this podcast more than anything to show you guys that it's not all sunshine and roses. But that being said, I definitely encourage you to pursue critical care medicine. It's what I do. It's my passion. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much that. That being said, in part one, I discussed and what you should listen to before doing this one of the training it takes to become a critical care medicine physician. Also, the issues with scheduling logistics, you know, being that people get sick 24 hours a day, seven days a week and all that. But now let's talk about the actual job of critical care. Now, if a patient is in the ICU, it's honestly, for lack of a better phrasing, they're trying to die. If you're in trauma, surgical, neurocritical care, cardiothoracic, medical ICU, oncology ICU, or cardiac ICU, you being the physician, nurse, and PPA, you're standing between life or death of many patients. They're critically ill. That's, that's in the definition of critical care. It's in the name. And it is your job to not let them. Sometimes they try really, really hard to do so, by the way. And I'm only sort of kidding. This gig is pretty morbid. A lot of people die. At the same time, we do save a lot of lives, guys. Don't think it's all bad. But we have coping mechanisms to get through this. I mean, all you really need to do is go check out the meme pages. And you'll see how, you know, sometimes even sick for that matter, people have uh, figured out ways to cope with this with this issue. So let's go over some of the business as well as dynamics that you can see in the ICU. There are multiple settings for intensive care units. There are different ways that they're set up. For example, there's such thing as a closed ICU, which is the vast majority, where the intensivist steers the ship. But you could also be in an an ICU where there's an open ICU, where if you're the intensive care doctor and PPA, you may not have full control of the management of the patient. As an intensivist, you're not really trained, at least uh, mentally, to share this responsibility with a hospitalist. No offense for hospitalists, of course. There are plenty of hospitalists out there who could do the ICU job, and I would personally trust them with my life. But this is not the norm. They're not trained for it. It becomes a little bit of a limbo trying to figure out how to play nice in the sandbox. And I'm just being honest here. There's also a scenario less discussed where sometimes there are multiple ICU groups at the same hospital. And if you're practicing in one of these groups, you're going to have to hustle out for some consoles and to keep yourself compensated. I almost said constipated. Anyway, on the flip side, other physicians will try to punt patients to you if they don't know what's going on. You will be the dumping ground. You will be the last line before the demise of the patient. So you should definitely be prepared to receive phone calls with the other person on the other line stating, uh, I don't know what's going on with them. So you need to be able to clear your mind, take a deep breath, say, okay, cool. I see what's going on here and get to work. You also receive a number of calls from the outside hospital for a patient who's been there for, you know, a month or so. And they're looking for a way to get the patient out of their hospital. They'll give you any excuse, tell you whatever story. And when you actually get the patient, you'll see that they pretty much lied to you. It's quite frustrating if I'm being honest. Now, if somebody picks, picks up the phone and tells me that it's a dump, I'll definitely have a far, far greater amount of respect for them. Another component of ICU care is that there's a very small margin of error in the practice of critical care. Patients are often at the extreme of what their physiology could handle. Here's an example. And again, not that this happens in the real world, but these are just examples. A critical care nurse in a patient who's in septic shock, for example, who's running life-sustaining IV vasopressors, they're in the room next door helping out another critically ill patient, they're being a team player, they're helping out their colleague, and all of a sudden their bag of levofed runs out. Well, you know what? The patient could potentially arrest if they drop the ball on this. If you're an intensivist, for example, you're trying to intubate a patient and for whatever reason, they have a difficult airway and you can't intubate them and you can't trach them fast enough, you can't crack them fast enough, excuse me, that patient could die. There are endless examples of this. I just gave a couple. But at the end of the day, the person who's practicing, whether it be a nurse, RT, or physician, has a responsibility for that patient. And honestly, thank goodness this has never happened to me, but I could imagine that your conscience could eat you up. You'll have to live with yourself and the mistake that you made forever. 
Continuing on with a small margin of error, this is obviously a very high stakes, high intensity environment. Don't think that there's just going to be one patient on your service who's going to be crashing while the other patient is patiently waiting for their chance to crash. Honestly, this, this doesn't happen. Sometimes there are multiple people who are simultaneously consuming 100% of your mental bandwidth. It's, a, it's honestly a high stress environment. Some people just can't cut it. I've had people come up to me and ask me if I thought that they were cut out for critical care. And I've been completely honest with them. I've told them no. Not everybody can make decisions on the fly. Even fewer of them can make good decisions. Not everyone can keep their composure when it's hitting the fan. That's a skill that needs to be developed and practiced often. That's the reason why medicine training is as long as it is. So when you see a clinician, whether it be an MD, uh, NP, or PA, who is screaming and yelling during chaotic situations, that's often a sign that they have a lack of emotional intelligence and maturity. Although sometimes it's necessary to get the room in order, but that's not something I personally do. As if those components were enough of a reason to try to get you to stay out of the intensive care unit, you also have to worry about liability because at the end of the day, liability comes along with it. And unfortunately, I'm going to go into this a little bit further, a little bit deeper down the line, but most people don't think that their family member is ever going to die. They think that their loved one is going to live forever. The words intensive care mean absolutely nothing to them. And when something starts heading in the wrong direction, they're not going to blame you. Excuse me, they are going to blame you. They're not going to blame the fact that the patient smoked 40 packs a day for 80 years and they weigh, I don't know, 3,120 pounds. Nope, it's not the patient's fault. It's your fault because you're not taking good care of them. That's part of the lack of accountability and personal responsibility that has been lost in the culture. Then they will go ahead and threaten you with litigation when things don't go the right way. I mean, <laughs> I've even been threatened in the ER upon assessing a patient for the first time. Talk about starting the relationship off on the right foot. When a family member says to me, oh, my friend is a malpractice attorney or that their cousin is a lawyer, I, I honestly want to just roll my eyes back, but obviously don't do that for the sake of not, you know, annoying them. I say, cool story, bro. But at the end of the day, I don't care if there's some powerful person or a, v or a VIP in their eyes. They're going to get the same exact treatment I give everybody else, which is my best. Okay, let's, let's go a little bit lighter here because I know a lot of the things I've said have been quite grim, quite dark. But on a lighter side, most non-medical people will think that you're an ER nurse or an ER doctor. They're nothing against them, of course. It's just that the confusion of this is entertaining. In the minds of many people, emergency and intensive, intensive mean the same thing. Even my best friend, who's an attorney, finally learned what I did when COVID came around. Before that, he thought I was, I was an ER doctor, even though I had corrected him numerous times before. It's simple layperson ignorance, no fault of their own. They have no business knowing the dynamics. It's similar to hospital staff in a non-teaching hospital who do not know anything about the differences between an intern, resident, or fellow. You know, that's just how it works. Another thing that they have to become used to, or you have to become used to in the ICU, is the chaos. You become so familiar and jaded to an extent that taking care of the critically ill patients become routine for you. You take this skill set that you've developed for granted. You see the nursing meme pages talk about how ICU and CVICU nurses talk down to the med surge nurses. By the way, getting more into that, the bullying is real. Numerous people commented on my Instagram page about how bullying amongst nurses is one of the biggest peeves. I'll get more into that later. Keeping on topic with being jaded, as an ICU doctor, I often take for granted my level of training and comfort around chaotic situations. It's something that I've been seeing every day now for several years. I often have to take a deep breath when a colleague consults me for what I may consider to be something ridiculous. But in reality, again, I have to take a deep breath and realize that they're uncomfortable and that they ultimately want what's best for their patient. And at the end of the day, I, I myself am not perfect, I'm trying to get better at this every single day. Now let's finish up by talking about interdisciplinary and interpersonal practice. I hate saying this, but in my opinion, it's true. The ICU is the top of the food chain. I know I may catch some heat for saying that, but it's where the sickest people in the hospital go. No offense to you, all the other units. You guys are all 100% necessary. I'm grateful for what you do. And that you do a job that I personally can't do. But you kind of have to admit that the biggest egos tend to gather in the ICU. You're, you're dealing with the top dogs, at least in the minds of those individuals. The top dog alpha males and females. 
and you need to learn how to navigate the water with these uh, pretty eccentric personalities. There are physicians as well. I mean, it's not all against the nurses, but there are physicians who have God complexes and who think that they're better than everybody else, even when they're clearly not. This also applies to NPs and PAs. I mean, you see NPs who, you know, forgot that they were a bedside nurse at one point or another, or PAs who, you know, think that they could talk down to nurses because they, they didn't form themselves over the course of many years working at different hospitals and training. And then these folks might go ahead and take overnight call. And even though they're getting a paycheck for taking call overnight, they cannot be bothered via a text message from, from the nurse or somebody who needs them to do their job. I mean, that's, that's completely unacceptable in my book. Then we have the whole thing about critical care nurses at times eating their young. And I know numerous nurses who are much smarter than the average physician. I definitely give them credit for that. But then there are also many nurses who think that they're smarter than the doctors. There are nurses who eat their young. I mean, I know this personally because I've spent many years with my wife now, as I probably mentioned the other episode, she's a critical care nurse. And we've seen when people show their true colors with all the different cliques that are hanging out, it makes life very difficult for the members of the nursing staff who aren't part of that clique. It's like a sorority. And I say sorority instead of fraternity or any other, type, any other type of organization. Don't get mad at me. But there's a statistical predominance of females in nursing. Don't get mad at math. The nurse, the nurse meme pages will go ahead and support me with this. Then there are also team members who are there to collect paychecks. In the case of nurses, they're nurses who just want to go into PA school, excuse me, to NP school, or to go into CRNA school. And when they're taking care of patients, they have a very lackadaisical attitude. I honestly chuckle when these people come back and try to ask me for a job. Like, do you really think I forgot that you didn't do as well as everybody else did? Um, I'm ultimately not going to go deeper into the nursing staff stuff because I'm not one to judge. It's not my profession. But I do witness it a lot. I mean, I work amongst you all every single day. And I don't mean to disparage nurses by, by any accounts. I mean, I have the greatest respect for, for the majority of nurses who I've worked with over the course of my career. And by, by all accounts, it's been far more good than bad. And before you get upset about what I've commented here, just keep in mind that I'm going to talk good about everything in my next series about things that are great about the ICU. Now, you have to take into account that many of the, many of the nurses are also extremely, extremely brilliant. And they could point out your flaws, even though you think you're all high and mighty because you're a, if you're a physician, you're a PA, you're an MP. These nurses are going to be able to point your flaws, mistakes, and things that you missed. There's, there's no room for, for ego here. If you can't handle somebody calling you out for a mistake, even if it's the person who uh, works for environmental services, if you can't accept your mistake, you need to get the hell out of the ICU. I don't want you working with me. Remember, we all practice extreme ownership of our patients. This could be used to your advantage if you're smart. The team will ultimately save your butt. And it's not all about the interpersonal relationship between doctors and nurses. There are also issues with the interpersonal relationship between critical care physicians and other consultants. You know, there's going to be some disagreements about what's the best course of action for your patient. And ultimately, you're going to think that you're right. But it takes a lot of intelligence to negotiate these interactions, to see the point of view of the other clinicians acknowledging when you need to back down and acknowledging when you need to put your foot down. Sometimes you're going to need these consultants to come through for you. It's not like you could go take the patient to the alley, for example, and throw down some punches and, you know, beat them up as much as you may want to. It's just not the cool thing to do. We're far more educated than that. So this goes ahead and concludes the second part of this podcast series. I definitely went over on my time. So if you got bored, sorry. Uh, part three is coming out soon where I'm going to be discussing death being the elephant in the room and the issues with family dynamics. I kind of left that for last because I really want to think through how I'm going to do that appropriately in a very, in a very respectful manner. Because again, it's not, it's not all bad, but again, the purpose of all this is to show you what's going to be facing or what you're going to be facing when you choose to go into critical care medicine. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate your, your support. I appreciate you all sharing this with your friends and giving me a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you choose to listen to me on. Have a great day. Bye.